Hello, Life Group leaders. I'm Gary Briggs. Today I get the privilege of talking about session 11, and it's on page 92 in our book. The title is Trust Exhibited, and I, I think the title is very fitting. The word trust is exactly what we see today with Daniel's trust in, in God. So obviously a very, very familiar childhood story, but it's also good for us big kids too. So we want to look at some of the things and kind of drill down and pull out some of the key points out of this this story about Daniel and the lion's den. Uh, it's called a den, but it's probably more like a pit. Uh, it talks about lowering him down into or throwing him into the lion's den. So the visual I get is more like a pit than a den uh, that we would think of. But So I wanted to, before we actually get into the the verses in the lesson, I want to talk about trust a little bit. That's a, a very important word that I think would be good to use as kind of the introduction in your class. That's what I'm going to do next Sunday. Um, we know just from life experience that every solid relationship, every close relationship we have with a spouse, a child, a coworker, a neighbor, church member is really based on trust. Uh, can I trust that person? Are they trustworthy? Are they um, someone who I can really depend on, who cares about me? So that's really what we want to talk about uh, a little bit at the beginning is this whole thing about trust. And it's like in the Bible, we know that God is trustworthy because of two or three things that he does. He talks about it in his word, um, how he's faithful. And in fact, trust and faith kind of go hand in glove. They're, they're very similar, not exactly synonymous with each other, but, but very similar. Uh, you can have faith in God because we can trust God. But how does God then help us be the kind of Christians or people who would trust him well, he uses his word, we know, um, in the Bible. He gives us a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of examples, and, and he uses his actions. Uh, we know how he answers our prayers, how he displays himself, uh, and he gives us his promises. There, there are a lot of promises, probably hundreds, maybe thousands of promises in the Bible, and I can't name one of the promises that God's ever gone back on, that he's um, broken his trust. I can't think of any example uh, in anyone else's life where God hasn't been trustworthy. So we see that in today's lesson where Daniel had an enormous amount of trust, as well as in lessons we've had previous to this, the, the fiery furnace lesson a couple of weeks ago, the uh, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and their trust in God was just enormous. Uh, and and their trust was, it was tested. And today in uh, this lesson, Daniel's trust is tested. So another way too that God helps us develop trust in him and, and put our trust in him is if when you get my age, I can look back over life and think of many personal experiences and examples of where God's been very trustworthy. Um, some things have been not necessarily life and death situations like like Daniel's facing, um, but pretty close with my kids and grandchildren with open heart surgeries and doctor reports and diagnosis and things where they're way beyond my ability to handle or process. And so I've um, trusted God in the outcome of those and have great memories. Some of the outcomes were completely different than what I would have ever wanted or even pr predicted. But I, I, I remember and clearly a lot of the examples where God's answer and what he did was actually absolutely the best way, better than what I would have ever thought of, dreamed of, or could have imagined. So there's a lot of ways like that that, that help us with our own ability to trust God and likewise with what Daniel uh, did in, in uh, Daniel chapter 6. In fact, that's where we're at today. Our, our lesson actually starts in verse 10 and goes through 24, but it won't take a few minutes uh, to start at verse 1. I think 
I would I would recommend you do the whole chapter of Daniel. You, you need to read it and discuss it. So the first nine verses are important, and the last three or four after the the after verse 24, I think, are very important as well. So again, not going to read all the verses, but we're going to kind of handpick some that are that are very relevant to today. And like I always say, what the so what? What what is it that God wants us to learn from this? What takeaways? We'll we'll be looking at those and mentioning some of those to you that you can can make sure your class um, gets from the from the lesson today. So. Let's, uh, let's begin. Uh, we know in uh, chapter 6, I fact, I want to get my Bible over here and kind of look. It starts out that Darius is now the king. We've been through several kings, and Daniel has been in a position of authority with each of these. Darius, it, it appears, and from what I've read, was very, they were friends, they were very familiar. Darius was apparently a part of Babylon. He wasn't brought in after the Medes and Persians took over from the Babylonians. Uh, he was already there and appointed as the new king. And it says in verse 1, he appointed 120 satraps, which to me is kind of like being a, a mayor uh, throughout the kingdom. And there were three administrators, kind of the governors would be a, an example. So here King Darius is setting up his org chart and kind of the, the people in authority under him and Daniel was one of the three administrators. The, it says he was blessed. He had exceptional, exceptional qualities in verse, what is that, verse 3. So he really stood out and was, um, again, very blessed by God with uh, management skills, leadership skills. And apparently so obvious to Darius, he had this plan to redo the org chart and put Daniel at the top right under him and everyone else in the entire kingdom would report to him. And we, again, you're probably familiar with the story uh, from from uh, the past or kids' Bible studies or whatever, like I am. I, I keep thinking about the flannel graph and my mom's shoebox of characters, and this was one of the stories she could tell and and put up on the little flannel graph board when I was a kid. But what happened, uh, this, this word jealousy, the, the others were very, very jealous of Daniel's success so much that they came up with this plot, and we know the plot. They were going to come up with some trick, some way to get Daniel actually killed. They wanted not only did, well, they wanted demoted, they wanted him completely out of the picture. So they came up with this plan um, to have King Darius, the new king, do a decree. And we know this decree was that no one could pray or worship any god for 30 days other than, uh, than King Darius. So he kind of wanted to be god for 30 days, so to speak. Uh, I don't know why he picked 30 days and not 30 years, but he thought that sounded so good that he actually issued that decree. The um, this plot come, that was formulated or cooked up by the administrators and satraps, uh, they, there's several terms, they tricked Darius, they duped him, they played him, he fell for their trap there and signed into law this decree. So they knew that of Daniel, they knew what he did, it was obvious his loyalty to the true living God. So. As soon as they signed that in, in, into, as soon as King Darius signed it into law, they then, and sure enough, caught Daniel. Now, one of the things that's important to point out um, in verse 10, it says, When Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where, hit, where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God. So let's kind of drill down on that a second. It almost feel the sense of urgency. It doesn't say the word immediately, but I can kind of feel that, that when Daniel learned about the decree, he immediately went home. This was a, a dilemma a huge kind of life and death dilemma. He knew where his loyalties 
lie with it with with his prayer habits which was a good habit to have to pray three times a day to god and now this decree was out that if he prayed to to god anyone else but king darius he would die get thrown into the lion's den so it seemed like daniel was i, I can only feel the i can't feel i can only imagine the tension the fear the uh, anxiety, a lot of a lot of concern there as to what do I do. So the first thing he did was turn, because of his trust, he turned to God. And I remember Brother Matt's sermon last week. It's kind of interesting that his prayer followed kind of some of the formula or guidelines Brother Matt mentioned. Uh, first thing he did was not say God help me. First thing he did, he said he gave thanks to his God. So in spite of the situation, he honored God and, and for who he was and gave thanks to him. He acknowledged God's sovereignty. So these men then in verse 11 went as a group and found Daniel praying. And then after he was giving thanks to God, it says here they found him praying and asking God for help. So I, I can only imagine the prayer, God, how am I supposed to respond? God, what, what can I do? Is this, he probably asked a lot of different ways for different forms of help in his prayer to God as to how to deal with this situation. So that was very interesting there. That's an example of someone who's trusting God and his, his um, attitude as to what to do. So we know the story. They went and ratted him out. They, they squealed or ratted him out or spilled the beans, however you want to say it, to the king and basically repeated what the king had signed in, as the decree. And even then, in this government form of government, once it was signed into law, even the king couldn't undo what he put into law. It was kind of a unique authoritarian type of government approach but he could not undo that and but on down in the story we know the king was really distressed because he realized he had been played or tricked by writing that law and he himself spent the rest of the day it says trying to figure out kind of how to deal with the situation but there was no way around it now that it was in law so um, with that then we know the story they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den now verse 16 it kind of jumped out to me I was kind of rereading this this morning so the king gave the order and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den they didn't say they handcuffed him. They didn't say they tied him up. And it didn't say that Daniel went kicking and screaming. It, it doesn't say that he fought them. It, it implies that Daniel willingly went with them without any opposition because I think God had answered his prayer in the sense gave him the trust and the faith that whatever the outcome, Daniel could be at peace. So, and if indeed this was a pit where the lions lived down in the ground, is how I'm kind of visualizing this, it didn't say they lowered him down, they say they threw him. So at this point, if you kind of go back through the kings and from the age of 17 when he came into Babylon as a exile and through the years, he's about 80 something years old now. So I can only imagine being thrown into the den. That probably was uh, pretty violent. And so the king, again, with his relationship with Daniel, may your God whom you continually res serve continually rescue you. He knew of Daniel's relationship and trust in God and knew how important that was. That wasn't a secret, but he felt his hands were tied um, figuratively and that he couldn't do anything but it uh, ful fulfilled what the decree was by having 
him put in the in the lion's den. So we know the rest of the story. We're actually God steps in. Um, the the characters of the story we see King Darius, the administrators. Uh, we see now, uh, of course, Daniel, and then now where God or His angel actually steps in and intervenes. Uh, one caution. I think we should be careful of when we talk about this story. Um, this isn't a guaranteed recipe for every challenge in life. Christian A has a problem, a dilemma, goes to God for help, God intervenes, everything turns out good. Um, a lot of times that happens. A lot of times it doesn't happen. There are many other examples in Scripture where people pray and their prayer is not answered the way they wanted, but in God's sovereignty, the outcome is different. So we've got to be careful, uh, whether it's the fiery furnace story or the Daniel Lion's Den story, these had really good outcomes for all four of these young, now, now older guys, Daniel, but um, I think that's a caution there. So again, uh, God intervened and Another thing that, you know, I remember different sermons and, you know, the way this story is told and played out and visually, uh, there's a lot of ways God could have answered the prayer. He could have killed the lions, um, could have uh, answered or, or rescued Daniel in a lot of different ways. He chose to, and, and Daniel had, had reported to the king that he closed the mouth of the lions. Uh, they have not hurt me. It says in verse 21, Daniel answered, O king, live forever. God, my God, sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me, because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done anything wrong before you. So that was Daniel's reply the next morning when the king went to see if Daniel had indeed been rescued by God. So it was, again, a, a, with God's sovereignty, a testimony to others around of the power of God and what he could do. We know from the story that the king was very excited that Daniel was still alive. He was pretty upset, very upset with the administrators and satraps who had tried to trick him and did trick him with a decree. So he ordered that those administrators be thrown into the lion's den. And same thing, it says thrown. So pretty aggressive. They were thrown into, and their families. And I always thought that was kind of, odd or harsh or cruel um, but apparently in those days the law and the rules were if like a king had someone put to death he didn't want the children growing up or the spouse at a later time in life plotting to take revenge and get vindication so to avoid that uh, when the criminal was put to death, a lot of times they would put the entire family to death. And I thought that's, that's kind of a, a harsh way to do it, but that was the reasoning I, I understand. So great story, um, great outcome. Um, the, the word trust we started with, here it is in verse third, uh, excuse me, 23. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. So the, that word trust is just, I think, is so important in this lesson that we really drive that point home. And that's where then he threw the families in. And our, our lesson actually stops there, but in verse 25 on, it, I think it's important. Here King Darius, much like Nebuchadnezzar wrote the letter, the chapter 4, uh, here Darius is writing um, 
And it's good to say and, and that he issued a new decree. It's kind of interesting. This old decree, I think, was in effect. It's 30 days, but it was in effect for about a day, I think, when they instantly caught Daniel praying. And that very evening is when he's thrown into the lion's den, so maybe two days, and a new decree was written. And the new decree doesn't have a deadline. There's no expiration date on the new decree. It says, uh, he told the people, I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So it's like Darius actually got it. I don't know that Nebuchadnezzar did. He seemed like he did after he came out of the wilderness there. But uh, Darius really stepped up and issued a new decree with the actual truth about who the true God is. It wasn't him. It wasn't through false gods. It was the one and only living God that he talked about in that that session there, that section. So a couple of takeaways, I think, that I got and maybe you'd want to share. Um, trusting in God allows me to give up my life plan for God's eternal plan. Another key takeaway or so what in life we know we're going to be faced with many difficult choices it may be doctors diagnosis reports uh, divorce cancer career there's a lot of things in life way beyond our ability to handle or process or even know how to react to so when we trust God like Daniel trusted God and like Shadrach Meshach Abednego did uh, we're actually allowing God to give us that peace, that peace we need that with whatever the outcome, um, we're okay with it, whatever the outcome is, whether uh, I think Daniel, whether he was devoured by the lions or not, he was good with the outcome. And, and I, I saw that, and it appears that Daniel did go willingly to the lion's den because he was trusting in God with whatever the outcome would be. So that's the, the takeaways that I got from the lesson. Again, a heavy emphasis on the word trust and faith, just as the title of the lesson talks about trust exhibited, his trust was tested, and obviously Daniel passed the test. So that's all I have for you. Hope that'll help you this week. Have a good week and a good lesson next Sunday.